Game four is not at all interesting. But what is interesting is the situation under which it was played. It was an open tournament in Russia in 2007. Playing white is a guy called Oleg, Oleg Alyeshin. And playing black is Grigory Yarish. And the difference between the two players' rating is 150 ELO points, which is pretty significant difference. And given that the player with white is the higher rated player, he's rated over 2400, then really with the white pieces he should expect to win against this guy. Now, the most significant aspect of this game is first of all black's opening choice. He goes straight into our system. White trots out all the recommended moves. He puts his bishop on c4. Black brings his bishop out to f5. White goes knight f3. Black plays e6. And now White says to himself, OK, well, this guy is not as strong as I am. I'm just going to... I don't know exactly how to tackle Black's idea, but I'm just going to get my pieces out and await events. So he plays the very natural move, queen e2. And now that White's most aggressive plan has been thwarted, or move order out of it, let's say, Black plays knight f6. All right, h3. And with White possibly shaping to castle queenside, Black decides to frustrate him by playing his bishop out to b4. In general, if you could see that White is angling to cast on the queenside, queenside or that he might be, the placement of the bishop on b4 is, uh, is a pretty good idea. Because Black can work up very speedy queenside pressure in this system. Uh, by bringing his queen out to a5, he can play b5, he can put his knight on d5. All things being equal, White probably shouldn't cast on the queenside in this position. Anyway, the main point of this game is White continues to try to play natural moves. He castles. He brings his bishop out to g5. Now Black plays knight bd7. And around about here, White's got to find a plan. Um, Black has a perfectly reasonable position. Black's plan is, is pretty well documented. He can play to take on c3, damage the pawns, and then bring the, the queen to a5 and the knight to d5. He could give the bishop a prod with, with h6. With the white queen on e2, possibly rook e8 could be a decent move as prophylaxis. It's hard for white to make progress. Essentially, in these positions, the knight on c3 is actually a problem piece. It's not on the world's best square. And this is why white plays knight to d1. I think he's actually a bit afraid of black's idea bishop takes c3. So he's hoping to redirect that knight to a better square. He's certainly interested in playing the move uh, c3 getting rid of black tactic bishop. So um, it's a question of priorities. What was more important to develop the white rooks to, well, squares that might not be very good or to redirect that knight on c3? Well, white decides this is the right plan. So, okay, knight to d1. Black plays his bishop back to g6. Knight to e5. Knight comes to b6. Knight takes g6. White takes away the bishop pair, plays his bishop back to d3, and black brings his bishop back to e7, pawn to c3, knight f to d5. Well, um, again, this, this is starting to look quite decent for black. Uh, black is eyeing up the square f4 here. Um, bishop takes e7. Not sure about that. I mean, I think if White had wanted anything in this position, he, he would probably have been better off playing bishop d2. I think then black plays queen c7, and he's thinking about putting that knight in on f4. I mean, if White wants to play f4 in this position, I, I think he probably can. But you can see, actually, after a move like a5, let's say, it's not going to be that easy for White to take this position further. I mean... You could push pawns too far. I mean, White can think about playing moves like c4 in this position. But then, you know, he's got a whole complex of pawns to look after. And Black certainly has plenty of counterplay in this position. Uh, whether he drops his knight back to, to f6, which is probably the best move, or he even puts it in on b4. White's pawn on d4 could become especially weak in a situation of this type. However, this is probably more promising the bishop takes e7. Because after queen takes e7, black is now certainly threatening knight f4. And after queen f3, white could find nothing better than a rather miserable draw offer here, which of course black was happy to accept. 
Why does White offer a draw? Well, I think basically Black's pawn structure is very good in terms of nullifying the bishop on d3. I mean, Black's knight on d5 is at least as strong as that bishop on d3. I think Black can think about concentrating on perhaps playing a knight into the f4 square as well. So, if White wants to make progress in this position, he's essentially got to play c4, I think. And once he does play c4, Black can certainly think about targeting the pawn on d4. So I think White is correct to offer a draw. I don't think White's better. I mean, if you're going to try, if you're going to try and find a decent move for Black, how about rook a d8? I mean, Black could have moved his queen to c7 or f6 to give White the, the thought that he's going to play knight f4. But rook a d8 is just a good move on general grounds. And then, you know, who knows? Black is probably thinking about playing c5 or e5 if he wants to really start playing flat out for the win. So, draw agreed. Of course, uh, a victory for Black in many respects. 150 points lower rated. White got nothing out of the opening. He was probably frustrated. Got the draw for him. Okay, good day at the office for Black. That's the type of thing that the captain can do. So, I think basically what we learn from this game, this short game, is that this system is a very good idea against higher rated opposition. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a passion killer. It's a spoiling system. And... Um, well, if White decides to shunt out the pieces, as he did here, he gets absolutely nothing.